Happy Wednesday, football fans, and welcome into another edition of the Pro Football Chase Podcast. I'm Isaac Sines, and I thank you for joining me. In today's episode, NFL defensive tackle Jarrell Worthy and I break down the blockbuster trade that sent Jalen Ramsey to Los Angeles. We also recap week six and preview week seven's matchups. Plus, we'll debate trending topics including the Chiefs and Rams struggles and what's next for Marcus Mariota and the Titans. This is the Pro Football Chase Podcast, a podcast that has featured interviews with Rams wide receiver Robert Woods. 300,000 yards, uh, and you know, last year, unfortunately, I got hurt mid mid way in the season, but other than that, just just working and grinding to, to get to this point, and uh, finally broke it with a lot of games left. Packers wide receiver Marquez Valdez Scantling. Uh, just the fact that we got a, you know, uh, all pro on the other side of the ball, um, you know, and Devontae. Um, so when you got a guy like that, you know, that's just going to get the main focus. Um, obviously, you know, people start to know my name a little bit after I made a few plays here and there. Broncos offensive guard Ronald Leary. It would either have to be a counter or a pin and pull play when we get on the edge and run. Um, I think it's always impressive when big guys can get out that stance and move and hit somebody. So And rising stars Dalton Risner, Charles Amenahu, and Jawan Williams. This is a podcast that offers player perspectives from some well-decorated veterans, including T.J. Hushman Zada. And people will say, oh, well, is that person got a franchise quarterback? Uh, look, look at his record, does it they tell you he is? Oh, he has a great defense. He has his D.J. Carelli. You tell me a quarterback in the entire NFL that's not time break that does more with that. Game previews, recaps, and analysis. Turn the volume up. The chase is on, and the chase is live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into the Pro Football Chase Podcast. It's Isaac Signs with you, and joining me is my co-host, NFL defensive tackle Jarrell Worthy. We're ready to talk some more football. we got plenty to get into with... Big trades that happened yesterday afternoon on top of previewing Week 7's matchup. So, Jarrell, how are you doing today, brother? Man, I'm doing phenomenal this morning. Uh, I'm excited to get uh, get right into it to talk about uh, everything that's been taking place um, around the NFL, man. It's been some exciting storylines, man. So, uh, we should uh, just jump right into it, man. All right, bro. So on that note, this week we're going to bring back the Players of the Week. We didn't do it last week because we subbed out. We had Brandon Graham on the show. So, again, big thank you to him. I'll go ahead and get things started, Jarrell. On offense, my Player of the Week, and it's ironic, I'm going with Jets quarterback Sam Darnold because he beat the Dallas Cowboys, which is my favorite team, and it was not – very pleasing for me to watch him shred the Dallas defense in the way he did. The guy had not played the previous three weeks due to mono. He comes back. The Cowboys had no answers for him. The former number three overall pick carved up Dallas going 23 for 32 with a 113.8 passer rating, 338 yards, two touchdowns. He also connected with Robbie Anderson on a 92-yard score before the half. So this guy came out slinging. He brought some juice to the Jets' offense. And so for that, he is my Offensive Player of the Week. Nice, man. I think uh, he had a phenomenal week last week. I know, you know, it was an emotional three days for you, man. 72 hours have passed. It's been emotional for you. Um, you know, you guys have a chance to redeem yourself with uh, with the Eagles coming up this week, man. But, I mean, it's going to be a tough sledding for you guys, man, if you guys don't pick it up. But uh, my offensive player of the week, um, I will have to give it to a guy uh, who was uh, in Kansas City for a short period of time, was released or, or, or traded from Kansas City. Um, Carlos Hyde um, in his return with the Houston Texans, um, 26 carries, 100, 126 yards, 4.5 yards per carry. Uh, week after week, it's been starting. It's starting to uh, be proven the formula to beat the Chiefs, and uh, you know, which is basically time possession. If you can average over four, four and a half yards, five yards uh, per carry against this team, and um, keep the guys off, the, and keep uh, Matthew, uh, not <coughs> Pete Patrick Mahomes off the field. Excuse me. Uh, then you have an opportunity to win. And I think that, you know, with his 26 carries along with whatever, what, uh, what Deshaun Watson was able to do 
um, this past weekend, you have to uh, tip your hat to Carlos Hyde and um, going into Kansas City getting the win. Yeah, and I'm pretty happy to see Carlos Hyde getting some success after a roller coaster type career. We all know he's a tough runner, and so it didn't work out with the Chiefs, and the Texans pulled the trigger, acquired him before the regular season, and he's found immense success running behind that revamped Texans offensive line. So Carlos Hyde's running well for Houston, so I'm glad that he's finding his niche there in Texas. So now Defensive Player of the Week, Jarrell, I'm going with the player that I'm almost certain 95% of NFL fans have no idea who he is yet. And an emphasis on the yet because this guy can flat out play. We'll see him take the field on Thursday night primetime. It's Broncos inside linebacker Alexander Johnson. Johnson recorded nine total tackles, six solo, one and a half tackles for loss, two quarterback hits, one and a half sacks during Sunday's dominant victory over the Tennessee Titans. And to give you a little bit of a background on him, Jarrell, and those who are listening, he was indicted in February of 2015. He, along with a Tennessee teammate, because he played for the Volunteers, on an aggravated rape allegation. And he spent more than three years out of football because of it. However, all the charges were acquitted in July of 2018, so the Broncos signed him a few weeks later. This is a guy that was a complete stud in college and had that off-the-field issue not come up. He would have been a a day-two pick easily, second, third, fourth-round pick, and so he jumped Corey Nelson for the starting role and Josie Jewell there in Denver. He showed out last week as well, got the game ball, picked off Phillip Rivers in the end zone, So he is my defensive player of the week, and I cannot wait to watch him play on Thursday. Man, it's definitely an exciting story to see a guy come back um, from such an horrific story and, um, you know, to basically see that uh, he's living a new life now and having an opportunity uh, basically to prove himself. And he's been playing outstanding. Uh, The Broncos have a real good shot to get back into this division um, with the wins that they've had over the last couple weeks. Um, But I think my defensive player of the week, I would have to give it to a guy against another former team of his, um, Gerald McCoy, uh, his uh, two and a half sacks uh, against his former team this past weekend with seven total sacks um, coming from the Carolina Panthers, as well as seven turnovers. Uh, To be able to go out there to London um, against your former team, you've had an opportunity, uh, the first chance that you lost at home uh, to be able to redeem yourself and go out there and for that defense to put on that type of display and uh, for him to be at the head of that was very uh, was was phenomenal to watch so early in the morning. And so uh, Gerald McCoy would be my defensive player of the week this week. Yeah, Gerald McCoy getting a little bit of uh, that revenge on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It didn't work out for him the first time as both teams met in week two as the Tampa Bay Bucks won that game. But playing in London, it's a Panthers team that's playing a very good football with Kyle Allen. But now let's go ahead and change gears and get into the big headline topic that sent the NFL world buzzing on Tuesday afternoon. And it was a trade that the Rams made. Now, of course, before they pulled the trigger on this mega deal to acquire Jalen Ramsey, they shipped out Marcus Peters to the Baltimore Ravens. They got Kenny Young in exchange, a linebacker. 24 years old, played his college ball at UCLA. He's been a reserve player for Baltimore. They also acquired draft compensation, a fifth-round pick. And then they also helped their offensive line because they acquired Austin Corbett from the Cleveland Browns for an undisclosed 2021 draft pick. But the big one came after Jarrell, Jalen Ramsey, and the price was not cheap as they sent the Jaguars first-round picks in 2020 and 2021, as well as a fourth-round pick in 2021. So what are your thoughts on this deal, and did the Rams overpay for Jalen Ramsey? No, I don't think you overpay for uh, Jalen Ramsey. I mean, he's been at the top of the game as far as uh, elite cornerback play uh, since he's entered into the league. He's had numerous opportunities uh, in order to be successful in Jacksonville. Uh, that The relationships didn't um, work out. Um, but I think both sides won here. You know, obviously Jacksonville, you know, they, they got the price that they wanted for uh, for a phenomenal player is, and, and Jalen Ramsey. And when you have uh, when you have a guy like Jalen Ramsey going to a defense that's been in need uh, as far as the secondary play is going, 
um, then I think both teams have a, a, a great chance to come out on the, on the winning side of this. Um, you know, Jalen Ramsey comes in with an attitude uh, in which he's hardworking. Um, he's been at the top of the league as far as pass deflections, interceptions. Um, he's very one. Of, he's one of the, the few corners uh, that you can uh, you can complete a, a pass against. Um, he's definitely he's definitely uh, he's definitely elite in what he does. Um, and so when you come in and have that attitude uh, to a team that's been struggling. Um, you have to leave the scoring on injury reserve. You have Marcus Peters, who's been um, horrific this year, and you have a guy like that moving out to moving out your locker room. Um, you have an opportunity, man, to be successful now. And so, um, you know, hopefully Marcus Peters has an opportunity to, to come in with a Baltimore defense that that needs help as well, and he can come into a culture uh, to where he can be successful. And you know, Jalen Ramsey has an opportunity to do the same when it, when it comes to the Rams. So I think um, all sides on all platforms had opportunity to win in this trade. I definitely think the Jaguars, they maximize their value and kudos to them and Tom Coughlin as they really waited and waited and pushed off a trade until the Rams came calling with some desperation. The Rams have lost three straight games, allowing the second highest total QBR during that span. You know their defense has been struggling. They're ranked 12th in total defense, 14th in pass defense through six weeks of play. Now, you talked about Jalen Ramsey. The guy clearly is established. I say he's a top three corner. I still think Stephon Gilmore is the best corner in the NFL. And then Chris Harris Jr. and Patrick Peterson have something to say about that as well. So I wouldn't quite catapult Ramsey into the one or two range, but he definitely has put out some positive things on his resume. According to NFL Next Gen Stats, Jarrell, Ramsey has the fourth lowest completion percentage allowed as the nearest defender since his rookie year in 2016. He has nine interceptions and 45 pass breakups in his three-plus seasons. Now, here's my concern. I do believe that the Rams overpaid for Jalen Ramsey, giving up first-round draft picks in 2020 and 2021, Jarrell, because I don't know if you saw this, but assuming L.A. does not trade back into the first round, they will not have had a first round pick in five straight years. 2017, they moved up to get Jared Goff. They sent that 2017 pick to Tennessee. 2018, they traded their first rounder for Brandon Cooks. 2019, they traded down with Atlanta. And now they're going to be without a first round pick for the next two years. And here's my issue. Jalen Ramsey's in the final year of his deal. He's got his fifth-year option in 2020 worth $13.7 million, and then he becomes a free agent in 2021. And you look at the Rams' cap space, Jarrell. They currently have $3.349 million in cap, which is the sixth lowest in the NFL. Now, don't get me wrong. I know the cap space increases each year. But assuming they pay Ramsey a lucrative deal worth at least $17 million per year, more than 70% of their cap's going to be tied to five players. Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, Donald, Cooks, and Jalen Ramsey without any other money to provide depth on their team, which is what they're suffering from already on the offense and defensive line. So... I think this can be a train wreck down the road, Jarrell. I know it's a big acquisition for now and in the present, but looking at what L.A. has done, they could really put themselves in jeopardy as far as building this team and making them competitive in the long term. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. Um, I think they're putting all their chips at the table now. They realize the window that they have and the opportunity that they have now with this team. Um, when you have the when you look at the table, man, you know, uh, to uh, is getting older. Obviously, you shipped out Marcus Peters. Um, he wasn't having a phenomenal year. Um, you know, Clay Matthews is, was is, was having a redemption style type of season uh, with the six sacks that he's had so far on the season. Um, you know, you have his his jaw wired shut. Um, you have you have Eric Buttle back there. You have they 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 basically pushed all their chips into the table. They realized how close they were last year. They realize that they have opportunities now this year in order to be successful. Um, and so, you know, uh, 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 McVeigh is pushing all the chips out of the table. And I think, um, you know, I think for the short term, obviously, it's, it's going to it's gonna have an opportunity to work out. But this defense has to come around. And, um, you know, when you list those those five guys, when you're talking about the 70 percent that those guys are, are mixed into with the with the cap space, um, you know, with with Todd Gurley under with not performing as well this year and Brandon Cooks necessarily not necessarily having 
that Pro Bowl year and Robert Woods, uh, you know, starting really, really emerging as the the one two uh, guy for this team, um, along with Cooper Cup, man. I mean, those two guys out of that group of five would be the ones that would be expendable if I had to if I had to say so myself. And so, you know, if you're a general manager looking at all of that type of stuff, I think you would have to take everything into account. Um, and so those, those guys are they, they're selling out now, and hopefully it doesn't bite them in the tail down the road. But uh, I think that. Um, the Rams will still have a chance to get back in it, uh, but they, they definitely need some help. But even at that, Jarrell, I mean, the acquisition of Jalen Ramsey doesn't solve their main issues. Their main issues up to this point in their three-game losing streak has been the play of the interior of their offensive line due to injuries, and it got worse for them. They lost Joe Noteboom for the season with a torn ACL and MCL. But look, let's go back to, to this past offseason. They couldn't pay Roger Saffold. They couldn't pay John Sullivan, the veteran center. So now they have an interior starting lineup that consists of Jamil Demby, Brian Allen at center, and now Austin Blythe at right guard. And their best offensive line right now is left tackle Andrew Whitworth, who contemplated retirement before this season and could retire after the year. So then now if you're the Rams, you don't have draft capital. You're not going to have money to go and find yourself a tackle to replace him. Now they still have Rob Havenstein on the right side, but there's issues there in the interior. And then the defense, man, it's not just the secondary. Their linebackers have struggled getting off blocks, making plays. So I understand the magnitude of Jalen Ramsey and what he can bring to a defense and Wade Phillips, I'm sure is going to put him to great use with his schemes and one-on-one coverage. But I just don't even know if this trade's going to help the most glaring issues on the Rams football team right now, which is what makes this trade a little bit more concerning for me than it may be for others. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of if it's ands um, when you can, when you discuss this trade, when you discuss the, the entirety of the whole team. Uh, but I've been in situations like that before where the injury bug is bitten. You know, you have to find players in order, you know, that can compete and go out there and, and win. And sometimes, you know, the young guys that you have to plug in and play, man, they have to uh, really grow up and, and gain uh, traction each and every each and every week. And so, you know, guys like Brian Allen, you know, I've, I've had opportunity to be around him in Michigan State. I know that. Um, he's a hard worker and, you know, each and every week he's going to, um, you know, gain, he's going to gain traction to be able to, uh, to be able to have success within their offense. And so I just think that, uh, it's really more so, uh, for me, it's that running game. Um, Ty Gurley is, is the most important piece of their offense. And if they don't have an opportunity to get him running, I don't necessarily see them having any success. I think their passing game is elite, but to have that same success that they had a couple of years ago going into the, the, the going deep into the playoffs and as well as the Super Bowl, they have to have that running game as well as that play action attack to in order for them to be able to compete. Um, this defense is built for them to to have a lead. I mean, they have great pass rushers. They're built to be able to get upfield and and uh and, and wreak havoc and and you know basically sit and watch quarterbacks um, make decisions and make, you know, terrible decisions. And that's how they're built. Um, they're not necessarily built to be in close games. So they need Todd Gurley and this offensive line to be able to return to elite status. Well, we'll see how that trade plays out for the Rams as they look to snap their three-game losing streak here in week number seven. But we're going to go ahead and segue to the next topic. And the topic is, which team is in more trouble following their week six loss? Is it the Rams, who are 3-3, three and three, the Cowboys, who are 3-3 three and three and just dropped a, a loss to the previously winless New York Jets? Or is it the Chiefs, <laughs> who are 4-2? and two? Now, here's a crazy stat, Jarrell. The Chiefs who started 4-0, the Rams started 3-0, the Cowboys started 3-0, and all three of those teams are combined 0-8 since their undefeated starts. So with that, I turn to you, Jarrell. Which team of these three do you think is in the most trouble moving forward? Uh, what I say out of the, uh, this three um – I would say it'd have to be the Rams um, solely on a few occasions, uh, on a few reasons. Um, you know, the the departure of Marcus Peters, uh, you know, obviously he was been, he hasn't been playing up to par like he, he was a, a year ago, um, affects this defense. Obviously, Jalen Ramsey comes in, is going to try to 
helps solidify one half of the field when it comes to just they're not really necessarily going to ask him to do a lot of things. Um, cover the best receiver, lock him down, you go wherever he goes, and then we'll figure out the rest coverage-wise um, until he gets up to speed. Um, but the the missing of Clay Matthews for the for the for the next six to eight weeks with the with the j- broken jaw with he him having six sacks on the year, um, top in the um, top on his team as far as defensive pressure they're going to miss that. Aaron Donald hasn't really been having the same type of the same effect that he's had in previous years, um, and he's really had, kind of hindering his team where teams can type can scheme against him being aggressive upfield now to where it kind of opens the hole up a lot in the middle. Um, so this team has to improve their running game as well as uh, in the secondary and uh, that they have to improve. But it's really the emergence of the 49ers and what they've been able to do in that division, as well as the MVP type of season that uh, Russell Wilson is on at this present moment is the reason why I have the Rams being the most troubling out of these three. I think that the Cowboys necessarily only have to worry about Philly. And I feel like they're going to get, uh, they're going to get their act together this week. They have a big, important game this week. I don't necessarily see them winning this game, but I see their performance to, uh, to be at a high level this week in order to compete for this, uh, this division. And I just think that, you know, not every team is going to be able to come in and just run the ball, you know, every all, all day against the chiefs. I think the Colts had an opportunity. They have a really good running game. They have a very good offensive line. They have opportunity. Um, to get Marlon Mack rolling, um, as well as the Texans, man, with their improvement of their offensive line, the offensive line play is what really uh, beat up on the Chiefs. And so I think that, you know, obviously moving forward, there's not going to be necessarily teams that can run the ball as efficient as the last, as the previous two teams, but their offense is going to continue to gain traction to get better. They obviously, you know, uh, with the addition of Tariq Hill coming back, you've seen the impact he had already. Um, and so I just think that the Rams out of these three uh, teams are the most, have the most uh, trouble at hand uh, moving forward, just because of the other guys in the division are moving at a, at a much higher pace than they are. You make some valid points there, but I'm going to go with the Kansas City Chiefs as, as being the most troubling team. And it's also because of injuries. Now, I know every team in the NFL deals with injuries, but the Chiefs clearly are behind the eight ball, losing Chris Jones, their best defensive player for the foreseeable future. There's really no timetable for his return with the groin strain. Those are soft tissue injuries. Xavier Williams or nose tackles on IR due to high ankle sprain. And then I look at this offense, Jarrell. I mean, Patrick Mahomes has been hobbled with an ankle injury. You know, that's an injury that can linger for long periods of time. They started the season 4-0, right? They beat the Jags, the Raiders, the Ravens, and then the Lions. They squeaked by them on the road. But since then, they've been dominated in the trenches to the Colts, and then the same happened to them against the Texans on Sunday. There's a glaring hole on this Chiefs team. It's that run defense. He talked a little bit about it. They rank 28th in total defense, 30th against the run, giving up 162 yards per game. You cannot win long-term with that formula. I know that Patrick Mahomes, the guy is sensational, but in the last three weeks, his completion percentage has plunged. He completed 72.3% of his passes through four weeks, and now he's just connected on just 57.1% against Detroit, 56.4% against Indianapolis, and 54.3% against Houston. So his numbers are going down, and that is not just on him, but it's on his offensive line. They're without Eric Fisher, their starting left tackle, who's dealing with a groin injury, and he underwent surgery. So who knows when he's going to return, but these defenses are starting to corral Mahomes in the pocket, knowing that he's not as mobile because of that ankle injury. And then offensively, whenever you go up against Kansas City, You just plow the ball right down their throats, and they cannot stop you. You got Frank Clark, who they acquired for a couple of first-round picks from Seattle and gave him a mega deal. He's been Casper this season. He's disappeared. He hasn't really done much for Kansas City. They're committing a heavy amount of penalties. It's just unraveling in a bad way for Kansas City. I know you talked about Tyreek Hill's return, and we all know the dynamic receiver he is. But this defense, Jarrell, is going to be their Achilles heel again. And let's not discount the Oakland Raiders, who are at 3-2 and two and are breathing on the Chiefs. Next right now, you know, Kansas City's on a short week, going up to Denver, mile high, a team that's playing better. 
And I wouldn't put it past Denver to pull the upset. So that's not even a guaranteed win for the Chiefs. So I, I see this sliding a little bit further. And I think that is certainly concerning for the Kansas City Chiefs right now. Yeah, it's definitely an alarming uh, situation, man, when you're thinking about how how uh, horrific their defense has been. Uh, but I still believe in the playmakers that they're having their stable. I mean, they're solidified in the safety position with the Honey Badger back there. Um, I think that Frank Clark is going to start to catch his stride, man. Um, he's a he's a player that's always um, never folded when the pressure's on, and I think he's going to have opportunities um, upcoming, um, especially this week against um, you know Denver. Um, they haven't really protected Flacco well. He has he didn't really necessarily play well last week. Um, they played well defensively, and they had the opportunities to, to rush in the football. But I think there's going to be opportunities there in order um, to 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 beat this Denver team upcoming. And I never necessarily I never want to bet against Andy Reid, man, a guy that's been through the fire um, through and through, and he's been have opportunities to have shuffle lineups. As long as you have an opportunity to give Andy Reid a, a, a spectacular quarterback and a couple guys on the outside, I think he'll 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 make his game plan offensively work. Um, to be centered around a defense that's been struggling. And so um, I think you'll start to see LaShawn Lash- McCoy have opportunities to get more touches, um, getting the ball on the edges with uh, Tariq Hill and more quick passing situations. You know, obviously Patrick Mahomes has been taking um, some hits and you can tell, you can tell once, you know, when he played against Indianapolis and they, um, he was down in his own end zone coming out and he got, he got his ankle rolled up and uh, making a completion. Uh, you can, you can tell that it, ever since then it's been a, an horrific um, situation for him and his mobility. And so uh, I think you take the time and you find a way to get him healthy. You find a way to get the ball out a lot faster instead of those five to seven yard, uh, five to seven step drops that he's um, accustomed to. And I think this team has opportunity to still get it rolling, man. I I just don't necessarily want to bet against Andy Reid and having so much firepower because even if, you know, their defense is, is is horrific man this offense still has opportunity to put up 40 point 40 plus points per game we've seen that before and so they have all the they have all the playmakers in their stable in order to do so and so i think that i don't necessarily want to give up on this kansas city chiefs team just yet all right well you're going with the rams is the most troubling i have the chiefs let's get into a, a fact fiction a statement or two here before we get into week seven picks So the first statement is, and this made news last night, it became official. The Tennessee Titans made the right decision by pulling the plug on Marcus Mariota and naming Ryan Tannehill the starting quarterback for week number seven. Is that a fact or fiction for you? Um, I think it's fiction, man. I think it's, they shouldn't, I don't think they should necessarily give up on Marcus Mariota just yet. I mean, when you look at uh, the pieces that have moved from his uh, his stable, man, his offensive line has been uh, they've they've been shuffled around a lot um, to where they're they've been limited a lot this year. Um, Derrick Henry hasn't been doing well uh, offensively as far as running, rushing the football. And um, and so, you know, they have to have more playmakers offensively other than A.J. Brown. I, and I just don't think that Ryan Tannehill is the solution in order to get this offense rolling. As you can see last week, um, he didn't even throw for over 250 yards, man. There was. There was opportunities there for uh, for them to be successful, and they still lost. And so, um, you know, they they uh, they have the same career winning percentage of forty seven percent. Neither one of the neither one of those guys have been spectacular. But I just think if I'm taking um, a, a guy uh, like Marcus Mariota compared to a guy like uh, Ryan Tannehill, one guy's been to the playoffs, one guy's had an opportunity um, to be successful. Um, and the other guy has shown me that um, time and time again, he's injury prone and they, you don't have, a, he has, even with the playmakers that he has around him, um, he can't get the offense over the hump. And so uh, I want a guy that's mobile, that God can make uh, swift decisions. And I think Marcus Mariota is a little bit better than that than Ryan Tannehill. And so I would have to say this is fiction. I'm going to agree with you. I say that's fiction. I don't think it's fair what they did to Marcus Mariota. I know he struggled. He went 7 of 18 for 63 yards with two interceptions. But he also has been sacked 25 times this season, Jarrell. 25 times. The guy has not had a clean pocket to throw out of. And you know what? A lot of people don't talk about this. But Mariota has had three offensive coordinators up to this point in his career. How can you even give fair criticism on a guy like Mariota who's been having to 
to learn new systems every single season. It was Matt LaFleur last year. Now it's Arthur Smith this year. Mike Mularkey was calling the plays for a year, and the Titans just were, were unable to get their offense going. I get it. Marcus Mariota, he's missed open receivers down the field. He's been very conservative for the most part of his career. But if you're the Titans right now, I know you're in desperation mode. You're 2-4. and four. Your backs are against the wall. You have a good defense. You're looking for a jolt of energy on offense. But Ryan Tannehill, if I remember correctly, isn't the most strong quarterback as far as what he's done in his career. He's been solid. Uh, I'd say he's been average. So if you're expecting Ryan Tannehill to check into the lineup and be some extravagant upgrade over Marcus Mariota, I think you're naive and you're wrong for believing that. And I do think the Titans, they are wrong in making him the starter. They should have stuck with Mariota. He's on his final year of his deal anyways, so might as well see if he can improve and how he can handle adversity this upcoming week. And they're playing the Chargers, who have been struggling as well, so this could have been a game for Mariota to get back on his feet, get that run game going with Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis. But it's unjust, I think, what Tennessee has done with Mariota. I think he deserves some more opportunities. And uh, for that reason, I agree with you. I say that the Titans made a bold move, but I don't think it was the right one. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, very sad to see, you know, these type of organizations, you know, when things aren't don't start to go well, they're so quick to make a change. Um, you know, they'll give a coach like, uh, you know, Malarkey. Uh, they, he, he's had, he had several opportunities there at the coach before stepping down um, and them hiring Mike Vrabel. I think that, you know, obviously I think Vrabel's the right coach and, you know, for this team, their defense hasn't been playing shabby at all. I just think that um, offensively, man, they, they have to, you know, uh, get, get stout up front. You know, obviously their left tackle has been in and out the lineup, um, Quentin Spain being in Buffalo now, uh, that hurts their offensive line as well. And you know, can, you can see the impact that he's having out there in Buffalo and what they've been able to do offensively. And so you need guys up front, man, to be able to, if you if you want to establish your, your yourself as a bully type of team, and you want to be a guy, you want to be guys that. Um, that are known to, uh, you know, handle their 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 business up front. That you have to have the personnel to do so. And I just think that um, it starts up front, um, and that's what continues to give Marcus Mariota the confidence that they need in order to be successful. And um, I just wouldn't really give up on a guy like that just yet, man, because he's been proven um, to have some success um, when you when you put, have the right system around him. And um, I don't, I'm, and I've never necessarily seen that with Ryan Tannehill, even even with having the same coordinator a year in a year out uh, situation. And so I just think that uh, they make up the wrong move there. And I'm not saying uh, that Mariota is their long-term future. Obviously there are some questions there. And I think a lot of Titans fans are ready for a change and they're hoping that they can identify a young signal caller that can elevate their franchise to the level that a uh, Super Bowl caliber level. But at the same time, you know, right now you're already entering week seven. I say you should have stuck with Mariota First off, fix your offensive line protection. Then you come to a quarterback decision because, yeah, you can have Tannehill out there who's pretty mobile himself, but I just don't see that there's going to be a big-time uptick in offensive efficiency with Ryan Tannehill under center. But that's uh, that's just our takes on it. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and jump into our Week 7 picks, Jarrell, as we always do every week on the Pro Football Chase podcast and so the first game is Thursday night football it's the four and two Chiefs at the two and four Broncos the Broncos have won their last two games this is at mile high who do you have winning this one um, I'm personally taking Kansas City man I think they've been knocking them out over the last couple weeks um, I think that the guys in the locker room um, they're tired of hearing about that this defense can't stop anybody I know that uh, a guy like Frank Clark doesn't uh, necessarily like all the bad mouth that you uh, you guys are getting. Um, but like I said, man, I mean, obviously with the absence of Chris Jones, they're going to have to um, improve. But I just think that, you know, I don't think that Denver has enough firepower, um, you know, offensively. I know they have a solid running game with Philip Lindsay. I just think that Kansas City is going to have opportunities um, to win this game, um, especially coming off a short week. So um, I have them winning 24 to 17. This game's going to be very, very close. And, I'm going to roll with Denver. I think they're going to get the upset at home. And 
Here's why. I talked about the Chiefs' defense. They're ranked 30th overall, and they've struggled to stop the run, and that's the very reason why I'm picking the Broncos to win. They got Phillip Lindsay. They got Royce Freeman. Joe Flacco's throwing the ball pretty well. Emmanuel Sanders is looking healthy. He should be available to play. I think Denver, if they can replicate what Indianapolis and what Houston did, which is dominate the time of possession, going up against a KC defensive front that they're beaten down, they're injury plagued, they're without two of their interior starters and I think they're going to run the rock right at the Chiefs yet again Chris Harris Jr. one of the best corners in the game he's already shut down Keenan Allen look for him to travel with Tyreek Hill Travis Kelsey's been a little quiet so maybe a big day for him but they fall short and they lose their third straight game give me the Broncos 24-20 over the Chiefs on Thursday night football that's an upset pick Isaac special right there. I don't know if Jarrell, <laughs> I don't know if you got your upset special of the week, but this is mine. I'm rolling with the Broncos and Vic Vangio squad. I like it, man. I think that um, it's a legitimate argument, especially with everything that Kansas City has been having to go through over the past few weeks. Um, I just necessarily never want to bet against Big Red, man. I know that they'll know he, when his back's against the wall, that's when he becomes the most creative. And I think that, um, you know, this Thursday is going to be uh, the, the same test, man. And I think uh, Patrick Mahomes, just like he said earlier in the year, man, we don't have to do anything but be ourselves, and that's good enough. And so I think if, they, if the Kansas City Chiefs have opportunities to be themselves, the normal Kansas City Chiefs, and I think they're going to uh, run away with a win. Next game here, got the 0-5 Dolphins, who, by the way, head coach Brian Florida has just announced that Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to be starting after he – Committed to Josh Rosen for the rest of the season. He's been waffling back and forth, obviously. So now he's going back to Fitz Magic, who's a former teammate of yours, Jarrell. He's going to go play one of his many former teams in the Buffalo Bills. The Bills are coming off a bye week, 4-1. and one. I interviewed Jordan Phillips, a DT there. They got good energy going on there. Bills Mafia is fired up. I have the Bills winning in a monster blowout, 31-10 over the Dolphins. Who are you taking? I'm going with the Bills Mafia. Like, there's no way I'm go- I'm betting against the Bills this week, especially with Miami and what they're trying to do as far as uh, tanking for Toa, man. I think that it's the worst thing in football. I think it's the worst thing ever because um, it never necessarily works out the way that you expect it. Um, in fact, and Fitzpatrick being such a great guy, a great teammate that I remember, man, it's tough seeing him. It's fun watching him compete still, um, but it's it's tough seeing him go through that that type of slide that they're going through, man. So I definitely have the Bills dominating in this one. Um, I have them winning a score of uh, 26 to 3, and I just have them continuing their dominance, moving to 5 and 1, and and, uh, and trying to keep up with uh, the Patriots in that division. Jaguars at Bengals. Gardner Minshew struggled a little bit going up against that feisty Saints defense last week. Jacksonville 2 and 4. Bengals 0-6, Zach Taylor has not gotten his first win as a head coach. Do they get it here at home, Jarrell? What say you? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I see you. I see you. I'm going going with Jacksonville, man. I think Gardner Minshew, uh, he had had an off week last week, and he had an opportunity. He had an opportunity um, to really uh, do some great things. Um, but I think that uh, I think they're going to run into the Cincinnati Bengals, man, and they're going to go in there on a high note. Their defense is going to play well, and they're going to be able to run the football, man. So I have them winning a score of uh, 20 to 9. I think that uh, Jacksonville is going to run the ball a lot, and uh, Gardner Minshew is going to shine. I, too, am going with the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Bengals have just been atrocious on defense. And to make matters worse, they're going to be without Drake Kirkpatrick. And William Jackson, two of their starting corners. Now, they may be able to get your boy Darquez Denard back in the lineup because he's returning to practice. He's been on the pup list, so that could help. But the Jaguars, I like Gardner Minshew to come in, light it up yet again. They'll control the time of possession with Leonard Fournette, who's been a little bit rejuvenated the last couple of weeks. Give me the Jaguars, 27-13 over the Cincinnati Bengals. Here's the next game here, the 4-2 Vikings going to Detroit to take on the Lions, who suffered a pretty nauseating loss in Green Bay due to Aaron Rodgers' stellar performance. And then on top of those blown calls, they're back at home taking on a hot Vikings team and Kirk Cousins. Who takes this NFC North battle? 
I personally would go with Minnesota. I think that um, what they were able to do last week against a juggernaut like Philadelphia um, and the continuity that they have defensively, uh, for them to go out there and uh, finally get Stephon Diggs and Kirk Cousins on the same page and I mean, and, and, and what a show it looks, and what what great of a show it looks, man, when uh, when those two are on the same page. And so um, I personally have Minnesota winning um, in a tight one, um, 28 to 24. Um, I think Matthew Stafford's going to battle, uh, you know, but I think Detroit, Detroit uh, exerted a lot of energy last week uh, against um, Green Bay as well as um, exerting a lot of energy this week and, you know, and talking about the referee situation. Um, I think Matt Patricia is a guy in order to keep them focused. Um, but I think Minnesota is uh, starting to, starting to, to get things cooking, man. And, um, and I like Minnesota, um, and a score of 28 to 24. I'm going to take the Detroit Lions to win this one at home, 23, 20. I like what the Vikings are coming off a strong week. Kirk Cousins at air attack, getting back into form, but the Lions, they're a darn good team. Their defense is playing very well under Matt Patricia, Trey Flowers, and Justin Coleman. Darius Big Play Slay. I think that defense is the deciding factor. They win by a field goal, 23-20 over the Vikes. Now the next game here, 3-2 and two Raiders coming out of a bye at Lambeau Field to take on the Green Bay Packers, who are 5-1. and one. I mean, I, I already know who you're going to go with, right? So why ask you, but who are you going <laughs> to take here? Okay, so look, man, this actually was a tough game for me to choose uh, because John Gruden coming off a of bye week, um, I think that he's going to have a lot of tricks up his sleeve as far as this Green Bay team, and he's going to have a, a, a really good formula as far as keeping the uh, the ball out of the hands of uh, Aaron Rodgers. Um, you know, obviously they're going to run the ball with, with Jacob, so I expect him to get, you know, 25, between 25 to 30 carries. Um, in order to keep, you know, their their offense off the field. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot closer game than what people actually entail. Um, I just think that uh, Mason Crofts is going to have to come up big against again this week, uh, minus the referees. And uh, I think that the, the Packers are going to win and the score uh, 21 to 20 is going to be a game winning field goal, just like it was last week. Um, and the Packers continue their role um, at home and they continue to impress. I'm sensing another upset here, and I'm going with the Raiders to beat the Green Bay Packers on the road. You talked about it right now, Jarrell. Oakland, their DNA is to smash people on the ground with that offensive line that's getting Gabe Jackson back in the lineup, an all-pro offensive guard who's been out with a torn MCL since training camp. And I like for Oakland to go in there, play some smash-mouth football, force the Packers to stop the run because Let me tell you, I was very taken aback by how physical Oakland was up front against that Bears defense. They beat them to a pulp. They rushed for over 150 yards. And I look for them to do the same at Lambeau Field. Look for Derek Carr to be that game manager as he's been. And uh, ultimately, I give the Raiders a very tight victory, 26-24 over the Packers. This Oakland team is motivated. They're full of young players. They're hungry. So give me the Raiders in this one over the Packers, who have been one of the better teams in the NFL up to this point. But let's go to the next game here, Jarrell. 3-3 three and three Rams at the 1-5 and five Falcons. I still cannot believe that Atlanta is this bad considering the talent they have. Who do you have winning this one? Um, I got the Rams coming in and uh, dominating this game. I think they're going to win uh, and a score of 31-14. to 14. Um, I think the Rams get back on track. Um, I think the Rams is going to travel with Julio everywhere he goes, uh, which is going to limit this Atlanta offense. And uh, I just think that, you know, defensively they're already atrocious, so they might as well start to – to turn it in, man, um, even though they haven't really lost division games yet and they have opportunities in that regard, um, they've gotten off to a terrible start. So I'm going to go with L.A. Not so fast, as Lee Corso says on College Game Day. <laughs> I'm going with the Falcons, man. I think uh, this offense at home, I know this defense has been absolutely treacherous. I mean, don't even get me wrong, but so have the Rams. The Rams, they've been horrible defensively as well. I mean, Jameis Winston hung up over 50 points on their home turf a couple of weeks ago. Now, I know they got Jalen Ramsey there. Who knows if he's going to play, and if he does, he may be on a snap count. I don't know, but if he goes head-to-head against Julio, that's going to be must-see TV. But give me the Falcons, 34-30. I think they find a way to get this offense going as it's been 
going, especially last week. I mean, they moved the ball very well against Arizona. Unfortunately, Matt Bryant, the 40-plus-year-old kicker, missed a field goal to force overtime. But I do like the Falcons in this one. Next game, Texans at Colts. This is going to be one of the best games of this week. We get to see who's going to be first in the division. Jarrell, are you taking the visiting Texans? Or are you taking Indianapolis coming out of a bye? So Indianapolis is coming out of a bye at home. Um, I'm going to take Indianapolis 20 to 17, a very great game, close game. I think it's going to be exciting on both ends. Um, but I just like what Indianapolis is doing. Um, if they have any uh, opportunity to get Booker back at any time, at any point in time uh, before uh, the game, that would be phenomenal. But the way that they've been playing offensively and um, defensively, man, they have the formula in order to uh, make a push for the playoffs. And so, um, I'm having Indianapolis, Indianapolis winning 20 to 17 at home. Yeah, I got the Colts too. I have them beating the Texans 28-23, and plus they get Darius Leonard back, who is out with a concussion, as well as Clayton Gathers, their starting safety. So some reinforcements for Matt Eberflus's defense. Next game here, we got the unbeaten Niners going to DC to take on the one and five Redskins. I have the 49ers taking this one 20 to three in a dominant defensive performance yet again. Jimmy G in that offense, they'll kind of just manage the game. They'll score late, and it'll be out of the Redskins' hands pretty much all game long. So I think the Niners get another thumping victory over Washington. Yes, I have San Fran dominating this game 40-10. to 10. It, would really be, it would be really great to see Adrian Peterson go for 100 yards, but I definitely don't think he's even going to go for over 50 yards against this defensive line. Um, San Francisco's moving on all cylinders right now, man, and they continue to get better week in and week out. And, uh, and I think they're just going to add gas to their fire right uh, again this week um, with a dominating win over uh, Washington. All right, we'll pick up the tempo a little bit till we get to the, the Sunday night, Monday night games. Cardinals at Giants. I have the Cardinals going into MetLife winning 31-23. Kyler Murray is putting up some big-time numbers. Saquon Barkley's status is in question. We're not sure with him. But I think Arizona, they're finding a little groove. So I'll take them 31-23. Yeah, I too uh, have Arizona winning um, in a score of uh, 27 to 18 over the Giants. All right, Chargers at Titans, two and four, two and four teams. We got Ryan Tannehill starting for Tennessee. Uh, I actually have the Chargers going in to win this game in a very low scoring affair, 17 13. I'm going to stop you right there. I think that uh, the Titans at home are going to be a much proven team this week. Um, I, even with Tannehill being the quarterback, I still think they're going to have the formula um, up front in order to uh, beat this Chargers team, which hasn't looked r- good at all offensively. And so uh, I'm going to take Tennessee in a really close game, 18 to 15 over the Chargers. All right. Saints at the Bears. This will be a 425 p.m. Eastern time start. Bears coming off a of bye week. Mitchell Trubisky should be back in the lineup. I actually like the Bears to come out to stop Teddy Bridgewater. Alvin Kamara is dealing with a high ankle sprain, so he may not be able to play. Give me the Bears at home, 23-10. to 10. Yeah, I too have the Bears winning. I think Mitchell Shabrisky coming back in the lineup is going to help them a lot, even though I have a lot of faith in Chase Daniels. Um, but I think this defense getting rested up over a bye is going to be dominant. So um, I have them winning in a score of 27-17 uh, to 17 over uh, New Orleans. Four and two Ravens at the five and one Seahawks. Earl Thomas goes back to Seattle, a place where he's played his entire career. And uh, let's remember, Jarrell, remember when uh, Earl Thomas gave uh, Pete Carroll the bird after he suffered that injury. So now they'll meet face to face in Seattle. I like the Seahawks to win this one in a tight game, 24-21. Russell Wilson is the clear-cut favorite for MVP with the way he's playing right now. He's the difference, but it should be a very entertaining game. Yeah, man, I actually think that Baltimore is going to come in and uh, beat Seattle. Um, I like Earl Thomas being back there to uh, to go hand in hand versus Russell Wilson. He knows all his tendencies and knows you know what he likes and what he doesn't like. Um, and vice versa in Russell Wilson. And But I just think that Lamar Jackson is really the X factor for this one. And so I have them going up winning um, in a close game, 20-17 to 17, uh, for Justin Tucker field goal at the end. By the way, I'm not sure why the NFL hasn't flexed that one up to Sunday night football and moved down the Eagles and Cowboys considering the <laughs> circumstances. But we're on that game next. 
Eagles 3-3, three three, Cowboys 3-3, three three, the battle of first place, NFC East, 8.20 p.m. Eastern time. I have the Philadelphia Eagles winning this game, Jarrell. I've been telling you all week via text, I think the Eagles are going to come in. I know Doug Peterson even guaranteed a victory, even though he walked back on his comments. This is a more motivated team. The Cowboys, they've looked lackluster the last couple of weeks. Their head coach is more focused on clapping instead of winning games. And so I think I think the Eagles are going to go into Jerry World. They're going to grind out on the ground against that struggling Dallas run defense. Give me the Eagles, as painful as it is to say, <laughs> 29 to 17. And mind you, number 10 for Philly may be back to Sean Jackson. And if he is, that's going to be bad news for a leaky Cowboys secondary. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm going with the Dream Chasers. I'm going with Philadelphia. Get out of here with and the it, Dream Chasers. Man, <laughs> the impressive victory, I'm telling you. I'm going with the impressive victory out there. I think that they're going to come in, um, you know, raring to make a statement this week. I think they overlooked Minnesota Vikings last week and, and, what, and their, and their uh, capabilities. And, you know, obviously we talked with Brandon Graham about that stuff and how important that stuff was last week. Um, so I think that the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be ranked um, to get some payback this week, and especially against a, a division opponent. Um, if they have an opportunity to get Deshaun Jackson back, then I'm definitely rolling with Philly. But uh, I think it's going to be a shootout, man. I think that the Philadelphia Eagles win uh, 34 to 28. I think that it's still going to be a shootout. I think um, they're going to have a game plan offensively in Dallas in order to score some points. And uh, I think it's always going to be an exciting game. And if Philly – Pulls it out as we both expect. Maybe next Wednesday I'll be here pretty joyful knowing that Garrett has been fired, but who knows? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens, man. I really hope for the best, obviously, but this Eagles team, they always somehow have a knack for going into Dallas and playing them tough. So I'm going to give them the victory by 12. So the final game here of the Week 7 slate, the undefeated. New England Patriots going to take on Sam Darnold and the Jets fresh off a of victory. My gosh, it still stings, but it's all good. 8.15 p.m. Eastern time, Monday night football. You know, the Jets are getting healthier. C.J. Mosley could be back, who's a big part of that defense. But in the end, I don't think it matters. Give me the Patriots 30-17. to Tom Brady will go in there. He'll make his magic. But it's this defense in New England. They're number one in the NFL. Stephon Gilmore, Jamie Collins, the resurgence he's had on defense. Those guys will make some big-time plays that give the Patriots a victory. Uh, yeah, I would have to agree with you, man. I think that the Patriots are going to dominate against the Jets. Um, it was nice to see them come out and have some success last week at home, especially against a Dallas team that everybody loves. <laughs> no, but, it was um... not nice to see, but go on. <laughs> but, man, I'm taking New England in a dominating fashion again. Um, I, I think that their defense is going to be dominant again. And so I have them winning 34-10 uh, to 10 and uh, just dominating and beating up on the Jets, man, especially with the Jets wanting to move so many different playmakers on their team right now. Everybody's up on a trading block. I just don't think that the Jets have the right formula in order to beat the Patriots. All right. Well, there you have it. There's our Week 7 podcast. Now, we were unable to answer fan questions this week. Uh, We were a little bit tight on time, but that's something that we're going to pick back up next week. We always like to interact with fans Sorry for that, not having that available this week, but we'll look forward to it next week. But until then, we're going to have some good football this weekend. Looking forward to some matchups. We'll be right back here next Wednesday to talk all things NFL. So, Jarrell, thanks again for your time, man. Looking forward to another week next week. Man, absolutely, man. Thank you again, Isaac, for having me on the show, man. It's always a pleasure to be able to discuss uh, you know, uh, the NFL and things week to week. Um, a lot of topics and uh, um, a lot, of, and to be able to give our troops about a lot of things, man. So I think it's always important, and um, I'm excited again next week. Um, stack up, stack up this week on your fan questions. Um, gain a lot of traction. Really think wholeheartedly about what you guys want to ask us, so we can have an opportunity to answer as many as many as we can next week. Yes, sir. You heard Jarrell, so take note. Looking forward to it. Have a great rest of the day, man. Take care and God bless. All right, now.